Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Last First Date Radio, featuring interviews with experts in dating, relating, and mating in midlife. And now, here's your host, Sandy Weiner. This is episode number 368, How to Be Funnier on Dates Even If You're Not Funny. Hello, everybody. This is Sandy Weiner, and welcome to Last First Date Radio, where we believe it is never too late to have the love you want, and that a woman of value naturally attracts the respect and rewards she deserves in life and in love. Today, I'm going to be speaking with writer and passionate human investigator Sian Lee about how to be funnier on dates, even if you're not very funny. This is a question that comes up all the time because so many people want like somebody who's super funny. And what if you're not naturally that funny? So we're going to be sharing lots of great tips for you. Every week, I also share a tip on how to be a woman of value. This is my this is my thing, the woman of value. And as many of you know, I started a new company this year called The Woman of Value. We have a new podcast there too, so check that one out. It's called The Woman of Value Podcast. And I believe that a woman of value is a woman who shows up, stands up, and speaks up for her value. So whether it's in life, in love, or at work, it's so important to own your value. This week's Woman of Value tip is if you want something, ask for it. And this is actually really apropos for today's guest because Sian reached out to me and asked for what she wanted. And that's why she's here on this podcast. And so we miss so many opportunities because we don't actually ask for what we want. We're afraid of getting rejected, of of being told no, but you're going to miss every opportunity that you don't ask for. So I encourage you today to ask for something that you want. You may not get it, but chances are that you will. So now for our guest, Sian Lee. She is a passionate human investigator. She has analyzed over 600 talk show videos, and she wanted to uncover the exact lines and formulas and actionable strategies that people have used to apply to all of us to be funnier and wittier. Her work has been featured on Science of People, Humor That Works, and Medium Publications, gathering more than 100,000 views. Welcome to the show, Sian. Thanks, Sandy. Very happy to be here. So, Sian, let's start with um, Humor Investigator. This is an interesting interesting thing to be. Um, What started you in becoming a Humor Investigator? So I started uh, when I spent a lot of time thinking about what my life purpose and passion really is. Um, And I realized one of the very helpful ways to find that out is to observe what I've been doing unconsciously. Um, In other words, what I've been doing on Saturday nights. And I realized I've been watching and analyzing talk shows for the past two years. But until that point, I didn't realize, oh, this could be it. So, and I also realized, oh, this is kind of different, you know, analyzing how to be funny through talk shows. And it's it's meaningful because I think if every one of us can just make people around us happier, laugh a little bit more, then the joy in this world could be so much more. That's when I decided to get more serious about it. I love it. Well, as many of you know, I was married to a comedian, so I spent a lot of years focusing on writing comedy, on producing a comedy show for children, and I, I agree with you. I think we all could use a little more joy, a little happy, happiness in our lives. So everybody seems to want to be with somebody who's funny on a date. You see it in profiles. Oh, you know, I want, I want somebody who can laugh. And everybody actually thinks they are funny when they're not. Um, so um, I find that often if somebody finds out that I was married to a comedian, they'll start trying to be funnier and tell me jokes that are terrible. So let's, let's, um, let's discuss why it's so important, why people are looking for funny on dates. Mm-hmm. 
That's a great question. Because I thought about it. How do you how do you be funnier on dates and why people maybe if they can be a little funnier on dates as well? I think the most uh, probably the most important thing is to break that initial awkwardness. Especially when you just met somebody, then you're like, oh, I'm not sure what to talk about. And a little bit funny stuff can really disarm people and prepare them for an engaging conversation. So I think, yeah, firstly, it's to break that awkwardness. And secondly, I recently came across a quote that I think makes a lot of sense. Um, so humor doesn't really rescue us from unhappiness. But what it does is enables us to move back from it a little. So to me, that's very powerful. So we all have unhappiness and um, things happening to us. And we're not trying to escape from the unhappiness, but uh, from the unhappiness. But stepping away a little bit from it occasionally can really just help you prepare you and get back to life. That's powerful to me. Mm. Do you know who the quote is by? I'll find that out for you. <laughs> okay, that's cool. I think those are really good reasons to break the awkwardness and um, to help us step a little bit away from the, the troubles that we're having. Um, I have seen one other reason that being funny or having a shared sense of humor is important because here's the thing that we all have different sense of humor. We, we laugh at different things. So I think sharing what you laugh at is actually a shared world view. It's how we look at the world. And that's something that came to me, you know, after my divorce, uh, because my husband was funny on stage, but we didn't really share a world view. And so his humor was more physical, physical mm -hmm. comedy, falling down, making, you know, fart jokes, things like that. And mine is more cerebral, more irony, more plays on words. And so can you speak to that? Uh, yes, absolutely. So I think that's a great point. So sometimes when I meet a new person and I tell a joke that I find quite funny, but the, the other person's like, huh, oh, uh, you see that uh, it's still quite awkward, but that's okay because you try and then you, after a few attempts, if you still quite connect on the same funny material, like you just correctly pointed out, then maybe it's a sign that maybe you maybe he's not the perfect person for you who knows so i think funniness can also be a great way to test it out whether this is the right person for you and if you very um luckily that you laugh at the same thing then there you go yeah totally um so we're talking today about how people can be funnier so what if people are really not at all funny, like they're super serious? Do you believe people can learn how to be funnier? Yes, I, I definitely believe that. And interestingly, if you ask comedians, a shocking number of them would tell you yes as well, and that they cultivated their humor. Um, yeah, maybe it's Andy, your husband. I don't, know, I don't know if your husband cultivated his humor, but may, I bet maybe he did. Um, so yeah, it turned out a lot of comedians cultivate the humor. And what they do is, again, something you will know this better than I do, is they create a bunch of stuff and then they may not know whether it's gonna be funny or not until they try on stage. Uh, if it's funny, they keep it. If it's not funny, then they will ditch it. So in other words, when they just start it out, they're not so much different than the rest of us. The difference is they put in so much work and refine it to make it into a masterpiece. Mm. Um, yeah, and another point I think I, I personally believe in strongly is we're not trying to be comedians. So we don't have to deliver three jokes in one minute. Mm. All we're trying to do is just to make people around us happier and maybe laugh one or two times more. And I think that's enough. It's, it's better than a boring conversation. Yeah, that's true. And that's a really good point about comedians because they were always, I used to spend a lot of time in the comedy clubs and comedians were always coming up to me and trying out humor without delivering it. Like when you're on a stage, you deliver. When you're just trying it out, my, my husband used to do that too. He would like be telling me without any expression. So what do you think of this joke? And it'd be like, that's not funny. But on a stage, it could be very funny. So 
Yeah, but it is a refinement process. And I've been watching the Jerry Seinfeld Netflix show, Comedians in Cars Drinking Coffee. And I always saw Jerry Seinfeld as this very formulaic comedian. He, I didn't think of him as naturally funny, but watching the show, I see he's much more spontaneous than I ever thought, unless the whole show is scripted. But I, I do see like there's, there are different um, pairings when he's in the car with somebody or drinking coffee with someone where you can see that naturally they have a connection. They both lack the same thing. And then there are other people where he's, it feels a little more forced, feels like it's not really his streamlined sense of humor. So it's, it's interesting to watch. Did you ever watch that show? Uh, I watch a little bit of his show as well. Um, I totally resonate with what you just said, because even my own experience, I was not funny at all. Uh, but somehow I'm just so naturally drawn to those funny people. So I want to be funnier. And I, in this process, I was doing a little bit what you just described, which is a little bit awkward, because maybe I was being a little bit forced sometimes. I would admit that. Um, but I think it's also part of the process. And right now, I'm getting much better. Um, and sometimes I can feel that, you know, some kind of funny stuff just comes to my mind. Um, and I was starting from zero. So I myself, I can totally feel this process. Uh, if you like, you like this, you know, funny stuff and you want to be a little funnier, it's totally doable. I did it and I think everybody can do it if they want. Yeah. Well, that, thanks for sharing that. And actually, this is a good time for us to learn a little bit more about you because all we know is that you've investigated humor. But we don't know anything else about you. So tell our audience, like, I, you know, where you live, because it's obvious you have an accent, um, even though you speak English beautifully. And what do you do in real life besides studying humor and writing about it? Oh, I'm glad you asked it. So mm -hmm. I live in Singapore, uh, which is why there's a horrible lot here, because it's evening here. Um, but I'm originally Chinese. Um, I've been living in Singapore for for about 10 years. I work for McLaren, uh, the F1 company. Uh, so it, it's, McLaren is a very serious environment because it's all about winning races, winning races. And I, I like I just shared that I, I stumbled upon this passion of mine and just I've watched uh, and analyzed Sandra talk shows ever since. So that's me. Thank you. And um, are you hoping to do something with this comedy work, body of work that you've been doing, like something bigger? Do you have a dream in mind for that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I do. I'm so glad you asked this. <laughs> um, it's like you, you read my mind. I, I do have a, sort of like a vision for this. Um, so as I was looking at a life purpose, I realized I would really like to focus on something that's unique. Um, useful, but also fun. It has to be fun. So uh, the way I see this going is I want to spread the word that everybody can be a little bit funnier. And the ultimate goal is to increase um, the amount of joy in this world by maybe one million times. It is not that hard because if you say, if, if I can spread this message to 2,000 people, let's say, and then 2,000 of them make five people around them, um, just laugh a little more, then I think mission accomplished. I love it. <laughs> and, you know, you keep mentioning your purpose, your passion, things that really motivate and light you up. And I think this is such an important thing that so many of us don't know our why. We, we kind of go through life without really knowing who we are, what we stand for. And that's another part that's really important when you're out in the world, whether you're, you know, in the dating world or in any other part of world, the world, to be able to really tap into your passion makes you a more interesting person. And so you're going to be more interesting, you're going to be funnier, and you will have people flock to you because you'll be so magnetic. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, you just reminded me of that because I forget. I think what, another another very important advantage of being funny is you just feel good about yourself. Whenever I make people laugh, I feel so confident and charming myself. And I think yeah. women of value, uh, that will be that will be an important tool in your toolbox. Yeah, I I hear you. I agree. You know, it's never important to me 
I didn't realize how important it was to me to make people laugh. But what drew my husband to me was he said I was one of the funniest women he met. And, but I never saw comedy as a thing for me. Like he was a professional comedian. I was just very kind of wry and always making comments under my breath, but I didn't have the confidence to say things out loud. And that's been a big part of my own growth as person after my divorce is to really come out of hiding, to be able to get on a stage and to be funnier on a stage and to be funnier with people. And there is nothing that makes me happier than knowing that I get laughs and also inspire with real important things that I want people to take away. So I think when we can intersperse the laugh with the deeper stuff, it just, it balances more. Absolutely. It's like uh, one of the scientists mentioned that how to be happy. And really it comes down to two things. One is pleasure. Another is purpose. Yeah. And I think the laughter is uh, the, you know, the pleasure bit of it. And it makes people feel joyful. And then you feel confident about yourself. That's, that's the purpose bit. So, yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah, Thank did you read Tal Ben-Shahar's book on happier? happier? Uh, you, sorry, didn't hear that. Tal Ben-Shahar wrote a book called Happier many years ago. He's a professor from Harvard, positive mm-hmm. psychologist. And he, wrote, he writes a lot about the intersection of purpose, meaning, pleasure, um, you know, and finding something that actually pays money too is helpful, mm. but it's, it's finding those intersections like a Venn diagram. I um, see. I see. The one I read is called uh, Happiness by Design. Mm. Not sure if you heard it, but it's very insightful. Do you know who that's by? Um, I have it in my bag. Okay. Can <laughs> right, you tell me who the quote was? We'll, we'll write that, these things in the show notes. Lovely. So we already got so many notes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get let's get into tactical uh, because you have so many things to share. So, how can people be funnier on dates? What are some of the the actual tactics and actionable tips? So, um, after watching all the talk shows, I find a bunch of stuff that I think even people that are not naturally funny can use them. Um, the first one is called callback. Second one is called misdirection humor. Uh, the third one is using visuals. So uh, we can go through um, each of them one by one. And uh, when we introduce some of those tactics, we will back it up with the examples I found uh, from the talk show so that the audience can really see it in action. I hope oh. that's helpful. Yeah. All right. Oh, so sure. callback. That's right. Uh, so callback, what it means, simply put, is to throw a joke back into the conversation uh, when that joke has been previously told. So there are two elements in this. One is an original joke. Uh, You don't have to be the one telling it. Somebody else can tell it. Uh, What you have to do is to throw that joke back into the conversation. That's callback. Yeah. So can I just share something? Um, My son and I are very funny together. So a couple of days ago, we were walking we take daily walks and we're walking in this neighborhood and there's this Italian guy who has, he's always at war with the squirrels in his yard. And he had one of these little slingshots that kids use. And he goes, it's a my new tool. I'm going to get the squirrel. And then he starts like every time we pass him, I don't know him from a hole in the wall, but he's always telling us that he hates these squirrels so much. And he's always putting traps out and, and that squirrel ate my zucchini. And then he shows us like what's left of his zucchini is like this little tip. And I'm going to get the squirrel. So we just riffed on this for the next half hour. And we were talking about how the squirrels are actually like aliens from another planet. And I had this whole bit where the squirrel, <laughs> squirrel's tapping on the window and he has his arm around the guy's wife and he says, I got your wife. <laughs> and so <laughs> it was just like, we were laughing so hard and we've been bringing this back. Like every time we walk, we, we call the guy Giovanni. We made up a name for him. I mean, just the, the whole thing. And we, we were actually like crying from laughter because it was so funny, but it was the callback of bringing back the squirrel each time and just, yeah. So 
to us, that was really funny. To somebody else, it's probably not very funny. <laughs> I'm sure it's funny. And I, I can see that the more you bring it back, the funnier it becomes. Right, right. And keep adding to it. Yeah. Okay, so um, maybe let's show um, examples of how callbacks are used. This is one of my favorite examples of callback. It is, um, it is an app. An Alan Show episode. So it was Britt and Connie talking to Alan DeGeneres about filling some blanks. Let's see. So I'm going to read a sentence and you're going to have to fill in the blank with the very first thing that pops into your mind. Okay. You may get a little dirty, Connie. Oh. Oh. At the end of the day, nothing relaxes me like a good stiff. <laughs> That's, you're taking too long. Burrito. In that example just now, uh, you heard people laughed when Connie said burrito, because that was surprising. Everybody is expecting something dirty. Right. Uh, so burrito became the initial joke. And then what happens is as this conversation continues, and they have more flanks to fill, and this is what happens. I'd give anything for a man who can get me to. Um, come home for dinner. <laughs> right? Well, woman doesn't want that. Hopefully for a good stiff burrito. Yeah. There <laughs> we go with the burrito. He has a call. Yeah, yeah, it's a bird that came back again. Uh, that's the first callback. Yeah, that's great. And, it, and it, after about two minutes after, uh, you will see something similar again. You should always have on the first date. You should always on the first date have a margarita. Yes, with your burrito. <laughs> Yeah, that's very funny. <laughs> but you can see from the um, the laughter that Connie gave that how funny it is uh, to bring back Burrito the second time. Yeah, so that's callback. Um, I mean, of course, Connie herself is quite funny. I mean, she came up with the initial joke and then she made a few funny uh, comments after that. But that I but that is not the only way to make people laugh. You can do what Ellen did. You know, just throw it back initial joke again and again and it's equally effective mm -hmm. and you don't have to be naturally funny to come up with you know the original joke right i like it <laughs> all right so we're going to talk about misdirection humor yes let's talk about that um so what misdirection humor means is basically you set up the expectation going one way but then you immediately going the other way Okay, sounds a bit abstract. Um, so yeah, actually, there are a lot of ways to do misdirection humor. One of my favorite ways is to uh, play with numbers. Um, let's see an example as well. So let's talk about this. Um, no one gets kicked off. It's not like The Bachelor or Bachelorette. No one wins a million dollars. No one, what do they win? Well, they win the title of being master makers. So it's really cool. We brought all these incredible creators and makers from all over the U.S. to come in and make things. And what they win is patches for challenges that they win and the, the title of being master maker, which is, you know, uh, good on the resume. Yeah. It sounds yeah, good, that, but it's really all about the patches. Right. These patches are dope. <laughs> right. Yeah, they are dope. Yeah. They win a little bit. Of, they win a little bit of a walking money, around yeah. money. There's some folding money. There's some money. How much? I don't know. What? Ten million dollars. So what happened there was um, so first Amy Poehler in the talk show, she ex uh, set up an, an expectation of the prize money to be really small, saying there's a little bit of money, not much money. But then after Ellen pushed it harder than she said um, 10 million dollars which is a lot of money yeah. so but then you see she set up the expectation going one way very small money and then she went the other way and that's why it's funny yeah cool cool 
Uh, just to help you understand a little bit better, I have another quick example for misdirection humor with numbers. In this example, so it was um, Sofia Vergara talking about a party for her husband, Joe. So Joe's 40th birthday uh, party was recently, and uh, it, yeah. it seemed like it was a big party. It was great. Um, it wasn't that big. Uh, it was like only like 150 people, but they... Uh, what Sophia did just just there was, um, again, she set up the expectation of the party size to be really small by saying, oh, it wasn't that big, kind of a Latin thing. Um, and she also used the word only mm. before she dropped the number 150, which is sort of big by most people's Yes, that's like standards. a wedding. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, by the way, her wedding hell. Like, uh, she get, she used the exact the same tactic when she talked about her wedding. Yeah, it wasn't that big. It was only family and friends. It was four hundred people. Yeah, so the, she used it again. Yeah, yeah, good. So that's misdirection humor with numbers. Uh, the third way is is most straightforward is just to show funny pictures mm. and let those pictures do the work for you. Um, and what, what's interesting about this tactic is it's very useful for public speaking as well. Um, and you may have noticed that Graham Norton always starts his show with funny pictures. Mm. The idea is um, you want to get some laughs pretty quickly, and then you warm up the audience and you will have their attention for the rest of the show. Or in our case, the rest of the date. Hmm. So people should bring funny pictures to dates? I'm sure you have some funny pictures saved in your phone, your funny mm. memos, or, uh, those kind of things. You, you can use them. Um, and you can even show them as quickly as possible. Um, because then, again, you lay the foundation for an engaging conversation later on. Mm. Uh, so quite interesting. I use some of the uh, Graham Norton's pictures for my... Um, for my talk recently as well. Um, you should be included in the show notes. You can check it out. So it's basically a number of funny pictures about cats. Oh, so that works cool. pretty, pretty well for me. Cool. So you've given us some examples about um, how to be funnier. Mm -hmm. And um, so you gave us one example about how to use it on a date, like the one with the funny pictures on your phone maybe. Um, so what are some other ways to, uh, to use these on dates? Uh, that's, that's a good question. So for visuals, it's quite straightforward, like you pointed it out, just mm -hmm. show pictures. Uh, for callback, um, what you maybe have to practice a little bit is whenever somebody, let's say your date, makes a joke, then you want to make a mental note and just remember it. And then later in a conversation, you, will, you can try to throw it back into the conversation if possible, do it again and again. So um, I guess the only thing that needs a little bit of practice is to make in a mental no, actually. Because most of the times when we hear something funny, we just laugh and forget about it. And then there's no chance for callback. Mm -hmm. But you can actually make a mental no, and they can put it back. Cool. That's for callback. Uh, and if we're misdirection humor with numbers, let, let's make it as, as foolproof as, as possible. So if you're going to talk about something big, you know, talk about a big number, add only before it. And then if you're going to talk about a small number, then say something on the, along the lines of it's huge for it, you know, and you just create that um, opposite effect immediately. So you set it up as being huge. Yes. Okay. You set up the opposite. Mm -hmm. of what you are actually going to say. Right. So that's that irony of kind of a little sarcastic. Um, yeah, it's huge. You know, two people showed up, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I said the exact same thing. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I just started out, by the way, so people say, oh, how, how, how big is your audience? I said, I had a massive audience of six people. <laughs> exactly like what you just said. <laughs> right. There's hordes of people. They're tearing my door down to yeah. be on camera. Um, yeah, that's great. 
Well, this has been really, really helpful, helpful, Sian, and I'm sure that our audience can take away several fantastic tips to be funnier, even if they're not so funny, as you have done in your own life, and you're the perfect example of somebody who can become funnier. So let our audience know how they can reach you. Uh, so they can reach me at um, info at talkwitty.com. It's I-N-F-O at mm -hmm. talk, T-A-L-K, witty, W-I-T-T-Y dot com. Okay. Um, and I'll be happy to share uh, any more tips or if there are any questions, they can ask me through that as well. Great. Well, thank you so much. And we will put all of these tips in our show notes. And I am looking forward to hearing about how funny our audience gets because of your great tips. <laughs> I look forward to hearing that too. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. And um, to our audience, I, I really um, appreciate if you will um, share this if you love it, and please go to iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts and rate us, review us, subscribe to us because it all really helps. And um, I also have a Facebook group that I forgot to mention up front, and it's called Your Last First Date. And so you are welcome to join us there. You just have to answer a few little questions, and it's for women over 40 who are looking for love and want a positive, supportive place to really grow as a woman of value. So have a great day, everybody, and I hope you go on your last first date very soon. Bye.